My microphone is nowhere near my mouth. I knew something was wrong. I just knew it. I felt like there was an unmediated uh, relationship between me and the camera. Something is in between. Now, I'm going to start again. Welcome to Navara Live. I'm Michael Walker. I'm joined tonight by Ash Sarkar. Ash, how are you doing? The lack of professionalism <laughs> on display, Michael. The shenanigans, this romperoon, like nursery reception, <laughs> kindergarten madness going on in the studio. I knew something was going. You know what, what? What would be happening now? Because Fox, our normal producer, is on holiday, but he would be tearing his hair out because he'd be saying, "Ash, we're <laughs> going to cut that false start out, and now we've got this moral <laughs> quandary because you've responded to the false start. Do we cut it out and then cut your response out? What the hell are we going to do?" Um, it's Gary, so he's just going to upload it anyway. Don't care. Don't give a damn. Uh, welcome to tonight's show. We can't guarantee as high a quality as usual, but I'm going to try and keep it. Pretty insightful. Um, and, you know, that was, that was um, Gary's very professional, very, very good producer. Um, coming up on tonight's show, <laughs> the Gaza ceasefire has been extended by a couple of days. Um, Pro-Palestine marches and a protest against anti-Semitism have occurred in London over the weekend. Um, a CNN correspondent's surprisingly frank coverage of Israel-Palestine shocks us again. Um, we've had some, some real examples of Great and terrible journalism from CNN um, over the course of this conflict. Um, very interesting to comment on and also to look at the content in and of itself. Stay tuned, of course, for all of that. As always, make sure to let us know your comments on YouTube Super Chat or you can tweet us on the hashtag Navara Live. Israel and Hamas have agreed to extend their ceasefire in Gaza for a further two days. Qatar has been the lead negotiator in the deal, and their foreign affairs spokesperson posted this update this afternoon. The state of Qatar announces as part of the ongoing mediation, an agreement has been reached to extend the humanitarian truce for an additional two days in the Gaza Strip. As part of the original pause over the weekend, Hamas released 40 Israeli hostages while Israel freed 117 Palestinians held in their jails. A further 11 hostages are set to be returned to Israel today in exchange for another 30 or so Palestinians. Um, though the deal seems to have stalled after both sides raised issues with the lists of those named for release. Um, presumably, it was also held up by negotiations for an extension, meaning that the exchange will go ahead soon. For many of the hostages' families, the ceasefire between Israel and Hamas has been a success. It's also brought about four days of much-needed peace for Palestinians in Gaza after seven weeks of bombardment left nearly 14,000 dead. That deal was set to expire at 7 a.m. local time tomorrow, which is why Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, came under pressure to extend it. Early on, both Hamas and Israel expressed a willingness to keep the truce going, though in different forms. Hamas said it wanted a four-day extension so long as Israel continued to release Palestinian detainees. Israel stated that it would be willing to extend the truce on a day-by-day -day basis with 10 hostages released each day. So the two-day extension looks like a compromise between those two points of view. But even while those delicate negotiations were ongoing, Israel refused to tone down its rhetoric. This was Israeli government spokesperson Elon Levy on Sky News. The campaign to end Hamas and bring our hostages home will resume immediately with the end of the hostage release pause. I'm not going to speculate, obviously, about the exact operational movements of our troops and the continuation of that strategy. Uh, but Hamas is on notice. That option for an extension is open. We want to receive another additional 50 hostages uh, beyond tonight on our way to bringing everyone home. Uh, and as soon as that framework expires, Israel will continue with full force towards those three objectives, eliminating Hamas, making sure the Gaza Strip can never be a security threat to Israel, and releasing all the hostages. Is it, of, it is, of course, Israel's military pressure that has brought Hamas to bear to agree to release those hostages. We've had it begging for a breather because it's been clobbered over the last month and that pressure will continue until we get everyone home.
So sounding very bullish there. Um, it wasn't sounding particularly conciliatory. Um, strong words, of course. But given that international figures made their views in favour of an extension pretty clear, it looks a bit like bluster amongst those who called for an ongoing extension were US President Joe Biden, the EU's Joseph Borrell and NATO's Jens Stoltenberg. And there was also pressure from the families of hostages not yet released. They may have spent the weekend watching other Israelis celebrate the return of loved ones. Amongst those released were mother and daughter Sharon and Noam Avigdori, reunited with their family on Friday. Also freed was nine-year-old Ohad Munda, who was released alongside his mother and grandmother on Friday. And with the release of so many hostages, questions have turned to their treatment while in Hamas captivity. Initial video of the released hostages, including this from Sunday, seems to show them in good health as they're handed over to the Red Cross. In many, they're shown waving to their captors and smiling. And it's not just those fairly controlled images that are coming out. Alon Ben David is the defence correspondent for Israeli broadcaster Channel 13. He gave this report on how the hostages were treated by Hamas fighters. רוב הזמן הם הוחזקו ביחד. עכשיו, הם מספרות סיפור, הם לא התעללו בהם, לא הפעילו כלפיהם אלימות. אוכל היה במשורה, לא היה הרבה אוכל, הם אכלו מעט, והם רואים על הגוף שלהם שכולם איבדו משקל. תרופות, היה ניסיון של אנשי החמאס לתת להם, אבל לא באופן סדיר. זאת אומרת, יום כן היו תרופות, יום לא היו תרופות. היה ניסיון לספק להם את התרופות הקבועות שלהם, לא תמיד זה עבד. אבל הם מתארות סיטואציה שחלק ניכר מהשבי, הם עברו ביחד. כשהם עושים אחד לשני הרצאות, וכל אחד מספר סיפורים, ועושים פעילויות זאת, השהות הזאת ביחד כנראה נתנה להם עוד קצת חוסן לעמוד בתנאים האיומים האלה של חיים מתחת לקרקע בשבי ובחוסר ודאות. חלקן ידעו, שמעו ברדיו במנהרה על קרובי משפחה שלהם שנרצחו בשבת השחורה, חלקן לא ידעו וקיבלו את הבשורה אתמול בערב מבני המשפחה. שנאלצו לספר להם שחלק מהמשפחה נרצח בשבת הזאת, אבל רוב הקהילה הזאת עברה למקום אחד, ובסך הכל הן מתארות תנאים סבירים. Ben David's account there accords with that given by Yoshevid Lifshitz, one of the earliest hostages released by Hamas over a month ago. At a press conference after her release, she said Hamas had, quote, treated us gently and fulfilled all of our needs, unquote. What those testimonies don't accord with, though, is how many Israelis have expected Hamas to treat the hostages. This is Emily Hand, one of the hostages released this weekend, being reunited with her sister. Just nine years old, the Irish schoolgirl was taken from the Be'eri Kibbutz on the 7th of October. Her father, Thomas Hand, was initially told that her body had been found at Be'eri after the Hamas attack. And this was his reaction at the time. They just said... We found Emily. Uh, she's dead. And I went, yes! I went, yes! And smiled. Because that is the best news of the possibilities that I knew. That was the best possibility that I was hoping for. I mean, really, really difficult to watch that. And I mean, you could see that was a father in a terrible situation. Obviously, he didn't w- want his daughter to have died, but he was assuming that how Hamas would have treated any hostage was, you know, so appalling. Obviously, people in Israel and people around the world are being told that this is, you know, ISIS 2.0. They have this insane bloodlust. All they want to do is 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 torture people and behead them, essentially. That's what we've been told, right? Um, also, we might question, how did he get told that this person was was killed? Apparently, there were unidentified bodies and DNA tests and, and the like. Um, but even after Hand found out that Emily was still alive but in Hamas captivity, he still anticipated unspeakable horror. This was Hand speaking before Emily's release. Unofficial reports came in that she was found dead in, in the kibbutz. Uh, like I say, it was unofficial. I was uh, I was relieved. I was relieved that uh, she was dead, and it was all it was all over. It would have been pretty quick. You try to imagine the 
the best, you know, you, you hope that it was quick. You hope that she wasn't ones, one of the ones that they chop her hands off and torture, just boom. That's a nice thought. I mean, we need to reiterate, however Hamas treated their hostages, I'm sure this will be incredibly traumatic for either anyone who was taken captive or anyone who was waiting for one of their captive relatives or friends to be returned, as there are many people still being held hostage and many people waiting for hostages to be returned. This is, you know, treating people nicely doesn't make this just a nice story where it was, you know, four weeks staying somewhere else, right? This is going to be very, very traumatic for everyone involved. But I do think it is telling that Israelis are basically told these are completely, you know, irrational animals who are going to torture everyone in captivity when, you know, actually the rational self-interest of these Hamas fighters was to treat people nicely, right? And I, 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 I'm not saying this out of, you know, I've seen some of the footage of what Hamas fighters did on that day. They, uh, they weren't particularly humane and there's a lot of hatred towards Israelis. You know, Israelis really hate Palestinians and Palestinians really hate Israelis, right? That's, that's the nature often of colonial violence or any kind of conflict. Right, So I, I don't think this is a situation whereby, oh yeah, Hamas, actually, they're really nice guys, they're treating people well, but they're not completely irrational. And if you're not completely irrational, then obviously it makes sense to treat your hostages quite well, because that is going to be a PR victory for you. Right? If, if Hamas were to have treated everyone appallingly, and then when they returned them as part of every, any deal, they told the world that they had been treated terribly and people they were held captive with had been sort of beheaded, uh, that wouldn't make any sense. But we've actually been sort of told the message we've been given is that it shouldn't make any sense because these are irrational, um, completely crazed people who only have a death wish. They're a death cult. You know, they aren't rational agents. And I think, you know, obviously, you know, obviously ground troops on either side are going to be driven by emotion, anger, hatred. I think in, in general, both the leadership of Israel of Likud and the leadership of Hamas in Gaza are, are, are pretty much rationally acting agents. And I think we should understand their behavior in that manner. Otherwise, we end up looking at sort of the rational Israelis and, and the barbaric Palestinians, which I think is the frame we're often given um, in the media, which I don't think helps us understand anything, really. Of course, we, we don't know how other Israeli hostages have been um, treated in captivity, especially as many are in the hands of other groups not connected to Hamas. But what we do know is how Palestinians are treated when they're detained by Israel. Al Jazeera spoke to some of those released this weekend. The feeling of being free is indescribable, but my happiness is incomplete because many prisoners are left behind. The situation inside the jails is really bad. They banned us from leaving the cells. The food was really bad. They kept us hungry. Shower time is so short. The situation is really catastrophic. They threaten us that if we celebrate upon our release, they will put us back in jail. Prison is by default a difficult place as we lose our freedom. But after October 7th, the prisons became much more difficult. We couldn't get our basic needs as women and as humans. The tap water tastes like chlorine. We used to buy bottled water, but even that became off limits for us. We've been beaten up. We've entered a phase of total isolation. We lived in exile. We left a graveyard. I was released naked in my boxes without a phone or anything. We've been tortured in jail. We heard difficult cries from other sections, especially prisoners from Gaza, and so a lot of blood. We heard all sorts of testimony like this of, of Palestinians who've been kept in Israeli jails. Right? People kept in solitary confinement for day after day. You know, that, that's often people under 18 who haven't been charged, right? So a form of torture, essentially. And again, why, why are we showing you this? It's, this, is, this is not to sort of do PR where we say, oh, yes, Hamas, they're these humanitarians and the Israelis, there are these devils that don't, that don't care about people's well-being. That's absolutely not what's going on here, right? I, as I say, I think both parties here are behaving to some degree rationally. I don't think one side is, you know, inherently more humanitarian or more empathetic than the other. I think both sides are, are behaving rationally. Uh, but I do think what we can take from this... What, and what is significant, actually, and significant to understand, is that the reason it's in Hamas's self-interest to treat Israeli hostages well is because they know that the world's media are going to care a lot about those Israeli hostages. You know, if those Israeli hostages had had come out um, from from captivity, you know, and told the press that they'd been tortured and all sorts of horrible things had happened to them, that they'd been sort of left, as that young Palestinian man said, they'd been sort of booted out in the middle of the night just in their boxes. 
that would have been streamed across all of the world's news platforms, or at least all of the West news platforms. But when the Israelis do that to Palestinians, relative silence, right? So it's not that Israelis are, are nastier than the Palestinians when it comes to how they treat prisoners. It's that the Palestinians have to treat their Israeli prisoners nice because they know that those Israeli prisoners are going to get you know, a platform afterwards. I mean, this is not to show resentment towards those people who've just been released, by the way. I'm talking about the differential way that the media treats two sides in this conflict. Whereas the Israelis, they know they can get away with treating prisoners like shit, right? And, and I do think, again, this is another sign of the sort of fundamental inequality when it comes to how the Western press treats two sides in this conflict. Um, Ash, I want to know your thoughts on this, sort of what we've learned about how each side has has treated its captives um, over the past weekend now that we're seeing a number of people released. So I think you highlighted something really important, which is the way in which the media frames the taking of hostages by Hamas versus the taking of prisoners who are Palestinian into administrative detention, which is kind of like a form of indefinite detention. And I think that what this is what you lose this really important context when you're participating in what i like to call the mainstream media condemnathon so you've seen this you've probably been subject to it it's will you condemn will you condemn will you condemn our hamas a terrorist group because what all of that means is you're pushed towards using more and more dehumanizing more and more Uh, I guess, like, absolutely dismissive language towards Hamas, where they end up in the position of, you're too evil for us to try and understand in any way. You're undeserving of precise or accurate coverage because you belong to the realm of hyperbole, of superlatives, the most evil, the most barbaric, the most appalling, will you condemn, will you condemn, will you condemn? And this isn't to minimise or diminish the suffering of what was done on October 7th, neither in terms of the civilians who were killed or the civilians, no matter how well treated, the suffering and the trauma of civilians taken as hostages on October the 7th, is to say you lose an awful lot of knowledge and you become worse at predicting what's going to happen next if you accept the view that Hamas are, to quote Israeli ministers, just human animals, that they're animated by this primal anti-Semitic bloodlust where it's like they, you know, popped up straight from hell with the sole purpose of, you know, wreaking havoc upon the lives of Jewish people in the Holy Land. Um, That's not true. The best way to understand Hamas is, yes, a group which carries out atrocities which fit the definition of terrorism, the failure to distinguish between civilian and military targets, the targeting of civilians, carrying out acts of violence where the intent is to frighten and to terrify the civilian population that fits the Bill of Terrorism. But that doesn't mean that they're irrational or without strategy. And also, if you take that as the definition of terrorism, the failure to uphold international law, Um, the objective of terrorizing civilians. Well, the IDF and Israel fit that bill as well. But we would never dream of using language which, I guess, obscured the rationality of the Israeli state. We wouldn't think that it made useful current affairs commentary to talk in terms of human animals or bloodlust or, you know, the sort of barbarous, violent drive of Israelis. One, because that becomes such a sweeping generalization that you're verging on racism. And two, that's not useful commentary or analysis, except for some reason, when we're talking about Palestinians and we're talking about Hamas in particular, That's not only considered 
useful commentary and analysis. That's like the hurdle you have to, you know, jump. That's the threshold you have to cross. That's the bar you have to meet if you're going to be considered a sensible voice on the topic. So when it comes to talking about Hamas, it's like, the less thoughtful, the less nuanced, the less precise, the less accurate your language, the less evidence-based your analysis, the more seriously you're taken as an opinion shaper or a voice in Western current affairs and news media, which to me seems totally topsy-turvy. To sort of reiterate, I don't want to completely repeat you, but it's sort of who who gets the the privilege of 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 being subject to explanation right so even if you you know we do, we don't say what israel is doing you know you know we tend towards the the pro palestinian side because not because i'm inherently more pro palestinian than i am israeli but because one side has been occupying the other right i'm i'm pro um occupied when they are fighting an occupier obviously you know not by not in any way there are things that a, an occupied can do to an occupier which i think are you know fairly awful um but in general i want to increase the power of the occupied versus the, versus the occupied so that's why you know we have a pro palestinian bent but when we're talking about israeli actions we never say that, that this is just animalistic wild bloodlust right we try and explain why are they doing that why are they doing that because they want the land they want to try and create a bit of a humanitarian catastrophe so that people try and storm the rafa crossing they want to create a buffer zone between themselves and gaza we don't explain this sort of Oh, they've just got this 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 bloodlust. They've just got this inherent desire which they were born with to destroy Palestinians. No, they they want the land and they're behaving rationally to try and achieve that. Now, it, it turns out that their rational actions are morally abhorrent, right? And that's why we oppose them. But we still explain what they're doing. But when you try and do that with the Palestinian side with Hamas, then suddenly you're an apologist for terror because we're not allowed to 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 give Palestinians the even the you know, the respect of saying these are rational agents, right, who, who aren't just driven by some wild bloodlust. Um, let's talk about another element of the release of captives, because as well as in a difference, or as well as there being a difference um, in how Israelis and Palestinians are treated in captivity, there is a difference between how Israelis and Palestinians have been able to celebrate those releases. Um, while Israel was joyful over the release of its citizens, Palestinians were barred from celebrating the return of their family members from Israeli jails. In the occupied West Bank, Israeli troops fired tear gas and stun grenades to break up crowds in Ramallah. But there was still jubilation as women and children were released by Israel with large crowds gathering to welcome home the freed. Some of those reunions were incredibly touching. Um, one of the released was 18-year-old Zaina Abdu, imprisoned by an Israeli court earlier this year for incitement on social media, a charge she denies. In 2015, Mara Bakir was just 16 years old when she was detained by the Israelis after being shot 12 times. She allegedly tried to stab an Israeli officer, an accusation she also denies. While some adults had been charged with serious crimes, many of those returned to the West Bank and East Jerusalem had been under administrative hold, detained or suspicion, um, detained on suspicion of minor infractions like stone throwing. Under Israeli law, Palestinians can be held for six months without trial, with those six months able to be extended indefinitely. And the extent of these extrajudicial practices means that while this weekend has been a reprieve for some, others have had their freedom withdrawn, taken away from them. This report is from Al Jazeera on Sunday. On the one hand, you have some Palestinian uh, prisoners and minors and women who are being released from Israeli jails. And then on the other hand, the raids and arrests continue right across the occupied West Bank. That is correct. If you look at what is happening now, what's been happening over the past few days, for every family that is celebrating the return of a loved one, there is a family that is suffering the detention of someone. In harsh terms, if you look at what's happened with the regards to the swap deal as a numbers game, the Israelis have released 117 Palestinians in the last three days. And at that same time, they've detained 
116 new Palestinian prisoners in areas across the occupied West Bank. There have been raids ongoing since last night into this morning. They really haven't stopped ever since the war began. They've intensified. They were ongoing before the events of October 7th. But just in the last 24 hours, overnight, 64 people have been detained and are now in Israeli custody. So these raids, these detentions, this pressure being brought down on the occupied West Bank has not stopped as part of Israel's occupation in these territories. And to that end, these have also been incredibly deadly. At least 239 people have lost their lives in the occupied West Bank where there is no Hamas since the events of October 7th. According to authorities in the occupied West Bank, Israel has arrested 3,200 Palestinians since the war began. So the number of people being detained by Israel, the number of Palestinians um, being detained, often without charge, often without being told why they are detained, and then being held for indefinite periods of time, that is constantly increasing. But obviously, that gets less attention around the world. Um, Ash, I suppose, you know, even producing this show today, we had a conversation in the in the office where we were, we were discussing how should we be describing the Palestinians who are held by Israel and who have been released because you know the uh, the Israeli side they like to sort of make this distinction no Hamas have released hostages we are releasing prisoners some of them convicted of terrorism now some of them may have been convicted of serious offenses but it seems the majority of them have certainly not many of them have never even been charged so should we then call them hostages i mean you know they they're not clearly hostages in the same way that Hamas have have, uh, have detained hostages. I mean, Hamas would probably call them hostages, right? They were taking hostages. What Israel are doing is is much more ambiguous. You know, it's, it's got something in common with taking hostages. It's got something in common with sort of keeping people prisoner. It's, it's a much more sort of blurry um, situation to describe. Um, but I do think the way that the media have sort of settled on, these are, Israel has Palestinian prisoners and Hamas has Israeli hostages, doesn't quite capture the reality. I think you're right to point out that the word prisoners doesn't capture the reality. So administrative detention can be something which you're taken into on the flimsiest of pretexts. I've been reading accounts shared on social media of people who've witnessed uh, children as young as 13 being taken into administrative detention. Uh, often used as leverage. So to try and intimidate them into saying it was so-and-so who organized the protest or that they'd witnessed so-and-so preparing for terrorist activity and hope and using the threat of indefinite detention or even taking their families into incarceration as well as a means of intimidating them to supply information in the shape that the Israeli security forces is, want to have that information because it's very easy then to get two or three soldiers to say, yeah, I saw that kid throwing stones and justifying a prison sentence on that basis. So we're not talking about a system of imprisonment which is based on things like reasonable grounds for suspicion, being charged in a timely manner, um, having access to legal representation throughout your time in custody. We're not talking about people being brought to trial in a timely manner. Many people are released after quite long periods of incarceration without ever having even been charged. So it's not right to call them prisoners because it gives the impression of a criminal justice system which adheres to some of the basic foundational rules of fairness, the presumption of innocence, which Palestinians under Israeli law, and, inter and by which I mean the way in which the Israeli law is exercised, simply don't have. Um, they're not hostages. I think, because there's not a clear demand being issued, whether that's a demand for a political response or a military response, or, you know, in the classic cases of kidnapping, um, a financial response. But I think that we can fairly call them captives. And that word captive, that I think begins to put the parity back in between Israeli and Palestinian lives. Those are Israeli civilians who are being held captive in Gaza. 
and it's Palestinian civilians who are being held captive within the Israeli criminal justice system, within the system of militarized policing. So I don't know if that would help, the word captive. I think that does make a lot of sense. I think next time we will script, we will use the word word captive. I mean, you talk there about sort of going to trial in a fair period of time. It's also important to note that these people are living under military occupation. So these aren't civil trials, they're military trials. Um, I think the you know the guilt rate is 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 close to one hundred percent because you you know there there is no transparency, there isn't a jury. Um, you are being tried in military courts because you are living under military occupation. Once again, London saw protest this weekend related to Israel's war on Gaza. On Saturday, there was another large demonstration calling for an end to the war. Tens of thousands marched through London. This, the first large-scale pro-Palestinian demonstration since ugly scenes in the capital on Armistice Day. Leaflets handed out by police warned anyone inciting hatred would be arrested. Along the route, police from forces around the country had been brought in to support the Met. Well, they're doing their job and we're, we're doing our job. Well, it's not a hate march because you can see it's really peaceful. Nothing's going to happen. Everything's fine. It's peaceful. But away from the main march, a separate, much smaller protest organised by Hizbut Tahrir, the same group that held a demo last month where the word jihad was chanted. There were tears for Palestinian children, but police on alert. Two women were pulled over by officers and asked to translate their banners. The best translation would be, who will roll up the sleeves for heaven? But without an independent interpreter on the ground, police asked the women to wait. This is an example of the difficult balancing act police have, allowing free speech, but not allowing anything that incites hatred or promotes terrorism. After several minutes of confusion, they arrested them. You're under arrest and suspicion in Section 4A, religious, um, Section 4A, um, aggravated uh, public Sorry, order. How, okay. how can you arrest us for She's something you don't know what it means, may harm defense. They were taken to a police station for questioning. Back on the main march, demonstrators said protests will continue until there's a permanent ceasefire, not just a temporary halt to the fighting. Now, for me, the scenes I saw on Armistice Day was one of the most peaceful marches I've ever been on. Loads and loads of families, around half a million people. The organizers said 800,000, police said 300,000. I can't count that many people, but it was an enormous demonstration. And it was such a united atmosphere. And these were people calling for peace. Ugly scenes on Armistice Day. I mean, there were some ugly scenes. There was the far right by the Cenotaph. Um, but in general, um, it's an incredibly peaceful march. And I think it's pretty despicable to describe it in that way. Also, um, in that Sky clip, um, there was the arrest of people holding up a sign in Arabic, right? Now, holding up a sign in Arabic, and then the police stop you and say, well, we don't know what that says, so we're going to have to arrest you, right? If if the burden of proof should be on the police, if there is no one on the street who is able to translate that sign, then you can't arrest the people, right? You can't say, oh, sorry, we don't, we don't have a translator here, so we're just going to have to arrest you via the precautionary principle, right? The precautionary principle shouldn't be used to arrest people because arresting people is a very extreme thing to do. I also think you can just use, you know, Google Translate sort of photos to try and... Um, work out how to how to translate the signs. I'm not really sure what was going on there. Um, there was another march as well this weekend, this time on the Sunday. And this was billed as a march against anti-Semitism. This is how Sky News reported that protest. Thousands of British Jews and their supporters were led through the streets of London by celebrities. Here to condemn the rise in anti-Semitism since the start of the Israel-Gaza war. I'm out here today because Jews in this country feel scared. They feel under attack. Um, some people are scared to go to the workplace. They're scared to send their children to school. Racism in this country, especially when there's an incitement to hatred, is illegal. It's also immoral. It's also unpleasant. And and I'm here to march against it because I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. There's going to be moderate people on pro-Palestinian marches, and there's going to be moderate people here. And what I'm here to do is to encourage moderate people to stand up and have a voice. Among the crowd, Boris Johnson showed his support. 
Organisers had asked politicians to join them, but controversial far-right activist Tommy Robinson had been told he would not be welcome. Police had warned if he left this cafe to join the crowd, he'd be moved on. Why am I being dispersed? Why am I being dispersed? Tommy, why did you come when the organisers told you to stay away? I'm here to do my job as a journalist. I'm at work. I'm at work. He was led away and later arrested. A pat on the back from a supporter, while others were glad to see him go. He's trying to align himself with your cause. What would you say to him? This uh, march is about tolerance. It's about inclusion. It's about kindness. Anyone who wants to use it in order to exploit hate or sow division is not welcome. This was the largest march against anti-Semitism in Britain since the war began, and police were out in force. The pro-Palestine demonstrations have tended to get fairly um, negative headlines um, in the country's press. Um, the Daily Mail, though, was impressed with that march against anti-Semitism, that's what it was called. This was their front page today. No war cries, no angry chants, just solidarity with UK's fearful Jews. Um, so there are no war cries, no angry chants. Uh, so they're sort of uh, contrasting it with the Palestine demos or the demos for a ceasefire. Now, calling for a ceasefire to me isn't a particularly angry chant. Um, now, what do I think about this? I think if people want to march against anti-Semitism, they have every right to. I also think the fact Tommy Robinson turned up shouldn't be used to tar everyone on that march, right? When people do that to the marches for a ceasefire, we get very annoyed. You know, there will be some people who turn up who are anti-Semitic, but they're a very, very small minority on a very, very big demonstration. When people use those people to tar the whole demonstration to say everyone is, is anti-Semitic, I disagree with that. And when Tommy Robinson turns up to a fairly mainstream march against anti-Semitism, I don't want to tar that march with the politics of, uh, of Tommy Robinson. But it is important to note it wasn't just a march against anti-Semitism, what happened on Sunday. It was also a march in support of Israel. And that's something recognised in a statement from the left-wing Jewish organisation, Namod, explaining why they wouldn't be in attendance. This is from a statement they tweeted out. It's clear from the event description that Campaign Against Anti-Semitism have organised this march in response to the huge weekly ceasefire demonstrations in London. They claim these demonstrations have turned London into a no-go zone for Jews, promoting glorification of terrorism and incitement to racial or religious hatred against Jews. This could not be further from the truth. The overwhelming majority of the hundreds of thousands of people attending these Palestine solidarity marches do so out of a profound commitment to freedom and dignity for all people. While we vehemently oppose anyone exploiting this cause to express anti-Semitism, we must also strongly resist attempts to discredit the entire movement for Palestinian liberation on the basis of a small, unrepresentative minority. We know from experience that many Jews who oppose Israel's war on Gaza have felt incredibly welcome and supported at these ceasefire demos. Namod is proud to be part of the Jewish bloc. There are many beautiful, laudable ways of showing solidarity with Jews facing anti-Semitism. These do not include smearing those mobilizing for a ceasefire and Palestinian freedom, Jewish and non-Jewish, as inherently anti-Semitic. Pitting Jewish safety against Palestinian freedom doesn't make Jews safer. It makes fighting anti-Semitism harder. True safety lies in solidarity with other marginalized communities working together to dismantle systems of oppression that put us all at risk. We keep each other safe because our safety is interconnected. Ash. A fair number of people sort of attended that one on Sunday. I think it's the first weekend where we've had a, a large um, demonstration in support of the Palestinian cause and for a ceasefire and a large demonstration um, against anti-Semitism, but also supportive of, of, of Israel. There are lots of Israel flags being, being waved. I don't think the organisers would deny and that that was also a march pretty much in, in, in favour of, of Israel. Um, what's, your, what's your comment on those two marches happening this weekend? The thing about protests is that they don't have ticketed admission. So by their nature, they attract a pretty broad base of people if they're large enough demonstrations. And many of the people who are there won't have any kind of official relationship, you know, tangential or otherwise with the people who organized the march. And I think that that's one of the things which gets persistently misrepresented about the pro-Palestinian march. And so like you, Michael, I don't want to take Tommy Robinson's presence, his unwanted presence at that march and say, well, this tells us something about the organizers. I think it tells us something about Tommy Robinson 
it tells us that despite being someone who has a record of anti-Semitic remarks, he's chosen to present himself as an ally in the fight against anti-Semitism because he sees it as an opportunity, I think, to further Islamophobia and to further his racist agenda in the UK. And that's not something that I think you can hold the organisers of the march responsible for. I think what you can hold the organisers of the march responsible for are their connections to the ongoing dispossession of Palestinians. So one of the organisers of the march, uh, Gideon Falter, he is also on the board of the Jewish National Fund. The, the Jewish National Fund. This is something which has been um, reported by Adil Ray, and the Jewish National Fund has been accused for a very long time now of helping to fund illegal settlements and their expansion in the West Bank. Now, when it came to the pro-Palestinian marches, particularly in the run-up to the march which took place on the 11th of November, there are all kinds of news stories, particularly in the Daily Mail, outlining these quite tenuous connections of people who were perhaps part of uh, the Palestine solidarity campaign and saying, well, this person's connected to this person who's connected to this person who is Hamas or part of the Muslim Brotherhood or something of that nature. There was an ongoing project to delegitimize the march. And I think on a very, very flimsy pretext, I think what you have here are much more direct connections, possibly, um, to a process which is illegal in the eyes of international law. These are illegal settlements which are being expanded. And yet, it's not in anywhere close to receiving the same amount of scrutiny that the marches in support of Palestine did. And I think that there are multiple reasons for that. I think one is the persistently anti-Palestine bias that exists within British media. That's also something which is deepened and made more acute by what I feel is endemic Islamophobia in the British media. So obviously because most Palestinians are Muslim and because Palestine is a cause which gets lots of Muslims out onto the street here in the UK, that means that it's viewed through the lens of Islamophobia. So these marches are already considered dangerous, criminal, terrorism adjacent by virtue of the ethnic and religious makeup of the people who go on it. That's not a standard that Sunday's march against anti-Semitism was going to be held to. The way in which the racism that impacts Jewish people plays out in the media, it doesn't work in in quite the same way as it does Islamophobia. Um, And I think that you've also got this really tricky business where the political project of Zionism, the aims of the Israeli government are sort of bound up with the idea of being critical of these things is being anti-Semitic. And that's not to downplay the very real anti-Semitism that exists in our society and the very real fears of Jewish people who live in our community, who live in the city, who live in this country. But it's to say that it gets quite difficult to unpick these things. So yes, it was a march against anti-Semitism. And in terms of being against street harassment, being against racism, being against people being forced to live in fear, of course, I stand in solidarity with all of those things. But you can't separate that, I think, from um, the feeling, I think, amongst many of the march organizers that Israel is being unfairly maligned for its military actions in the Gaza Strip. And I think that becomes really difficult to talk about. It becomes really difficult to maintain empathy and understanding towards people who are victims of racism, which is, of course, something we should all do, while also being, I think, accurate about the way in which those very real fears are sometimes used as a a sort of, you know, shield for the morally reprehensible actions of the Israeli state.
Before we move on to our next story, would you like to join me, Ash, Moya, and Owen Jones for a live panel show recording and a social next week, next Thursday. So that's Thursday, the 7th of December. Look at that poster. Um, Navarra Media is hosting our first in-person live panel show in South East London. There'll be mince pies, Navarra merch for sale. You might get a tank top um, and a vinyl DJ set and reasonably priced drinks. All the money raised at the event will help support our independent, truthful journalism. I'm sure it will be a fabulous evening. There is, though, I should warn you, very limited capacity. So if you want to come, grab your tickets now. The link is in the description below. Britain's new foreign secretary has won some plaudits for sounding tougher on Israel than his predecessor. He said this to the BBC on the weekend. Yesterday, when I met with the Israeli president, with the prime minister, with others, I stressed over and over again that they must abide by international humanitarian law, that the number of casualties are too high, and that they have to have that you know, top of their mind. We are going to have a continuous dialogue with them and keep making these points about humanitarian law, about civilian casualties, not just about what's happening in Gaza, but also what is happening on the West Bank, where I made very clear yesterday that the settler violence, you know, people actually, you know, targeting and on occasions killing Palestinian civilians is completely unacceptable. And those people responsible for that, it's not good enough just to arrest them. They need to be arrested, prosecuted and imprisoned. These are crimes. Those are fine words. David Cameron is, of course, right to call for international law to be upheld. Shining a light on settler violence is also pretty important. But I'm not getting too excited. Why? Because Western politicians always say these liberal things about Israel. What they never do is anything about it. Now, the most obvious case in point here concerns settlement expansions, which are, of course, the root of settler violence. Now, on this issue, every UK government has agreed Israel should stop expanding settlements. In 2008, Gordon Brown said Israel should stop expanding settlements. He did nothing to pressure Israel to actually stop doing it. Back when he was Prime Minister, David Cameron described settlement expansion in East Jerusalem as genuinely shocking. But that same David Cameron also opposed the kind of action, namely boycotts, that could stop Israel getting away with it. Then, earlier this year, Rishi Sunak briefed journalists he would press Netanyahu about settlement expansion. Yes, the same Rishi Sunak who wants to actually ban boycotting Israel, right? And what do you think is the result of UK politicians condemning Israeli settlement expansions while protecting Israel from any consequences for expanding settlements? Well, you guessed it, they kept expanding. This graphic from Al Jazeera shows how settlements have consistently grown since 1972. In 2018, there were 683,000 settlers on Palestinian land. The map on the right shows the effect this has on life in the West Bank. The green parts on the map are areas managed by the Palestinian Authority, of course, still under Israeli occupation, but managed by the Palestinian Authority. They are separated by the blue parts of this map, all under direct Israeli military control, and dotted strategically throughout the blue zones are the settlements. So they're shown in these, these red dots of varying size. Now, they make a proper Palestinian state in the West Bank practically impossible. And Western politicians know this. They admit this. Watch this speech President Obama gave in Jerusalem in 2013. Put yourself in their shoes. Look at the world through their eyes. It is not fair that a Palestinian child cannot grow up in a state of their own. Living their entire lives with the presence of a foreign army that controls the movements, not just of those young people, but their parents, their grandparents, every single day. It's not just when settler violence against Palestinians goes unpunished. It's not right to prevent Palestinians from farming their lands or restricting a student's ability to move around the West Bank or displace Palestinian families from their homes. Neither occupation nor expulsion 
is the answer. Just as Israelis built a state in their homeland, Palestinians have a right to be a free people in their own land. So as you can see, in his sort of usual, very eloquent manner, Obama talked a good talk on Israel-Palestine. But Netanyahu consistently ignored him. He wasn't persuaded by those fine, inspirational words that Barack Obama gave. And how did Obama respond? Well, you guessed it with a multi-million dollar aid package. Yes, in the final year of his presidency, Obama signed a new decade-long aid deal to Israel worth $38 billion. Now, this is why I'm not really interested in what any politician says about Israel-Palestine. I'm interested in what they do. If you talk a good talk on settlements, I do not care unless you explain how you are going to make sure Israel has consequences for settlement expansion has consequences for settler violence, has consequences for breaking the rules of law, rules of war, sorry. Because what we have at the moment is a situation where all Western politicians agree. I don't think there's a single Western politician. I mean, Trump was maybe a bit of an exception here. But other than Trump, you don't get many Western politicians who stand up and say, I'm in favor of settlement expansion. They all stand up and say, we are opposed to settlement expansion. Oh, but also we are opposed to any of the measures that could discipline Israel to the extent that they don't do it. And this is up to the present day. So Joe Biden has always been very, very uh, clear. He supports a two-state solution. He supports a viable Palestinian state, even while he supports pretty much unconditionally Israeli war crimes in Gaza. And guess what? Israel are still expanding those settlements, even amid the Gaza war. Um, they are putting more money towards settlement expansion. This is from the EU's chief diplomat, I'm appalled to learn that in the middle of a war, the Israeli government is poised to commit new funds to build more illegal settlements. This is not self-defense and will not make Israel safer. The settlements are, grave, are a grave international human rights law breach. They are Israel's greatest security liability. Now, they would be Israel's greatest security liability if Joseph Burrell or Joe Biden or Rishi Sunak or even Keir Starmer suggested that by expanding those settlements, we would reduce the support militarily, diplomatically, financially that we give to Israel. Unfortunately, we don't do that. You know, we send nice tweets, we give nice speeches, and then we say, oh, they ignored us and still we're going to give Israel everything they want, right? Which means that we are complicit in those settlement expansions. There's no point in saying, well, I condemn settlement expansions. If you are giving Israel unconditional financial, military, and diplomatic support, I don't give a damn what you say about settlements. What it is, pure and simple, is virtue signaling. It's taking positions because you know that it's going to resonate with a liberal or even progressive audience without feeling the need or really coming under the pressure to back those nice words up with anything concrete or meaningful. And for me, the explanation of why this is the case is the important bit. Why is it that you have a succession of British prime ministers and American presidents who are happy to condemn illegal settlement expansion, but don't want to do anything about it? Now, there's one way of looking at it, which you sometimes hear, which is the idea that you know, the Israeli lobby is too strong for politicians in the West to do anything about it. And actually, I don't think that's what's going on. I think the reason why you don't have those condemnations of illegal settlements being backed up with any real diplomatic or financial pressure, uh, any sort of reduction in arms sales is because Israel has always been perceived by the West as an extension of our geopolitical interests in the region. Now, this was something that was explained, I think, wonderfully, concisely um, and thoroughly by Rashid Khalidi in my recent interview with him, which is what one of the reasons why Britain committed itself to the formation of a state of Israel with the Balfour Declaration, one, 
was out of a sense of what you might call anti-Semitic Zionism, the sense of going, well, we don't want these people here, let's put them over there. But the other was the idea that if you created um, what was understood by uh, many British politicians to be the equivalent of a little Jewish Ulster, that would protect the land route between Egypt and into the Middle East, and that would protect British trade and military interests. And even today, when you think about which countries are lining up behind Israel, so not just Britain and, of course, the US, but India as well, well, that's all seen vis-a-vis regional, uh, I guess, power brokering, wanting to disempower in particular Iran. So Israel is considered an extension of US geopolitical interests. It's considered an, an, an extension of British geopolitical interests. And so that's why these nice and flowery words aren't backed up by anything. It's not merely hypocrisy. It's something else entirely. It's not in the West's interests to really police what Israel does, right? They basically care that they've got this ally in the Middle East. If Arab socialism, for example, I mean, it hasn't been a threat for a while, but in the 60s and the 50s, um, the idea of Arab nationalism and Arab socialism was a real threat to the British and the Americans. Therefore, having the Israelis there was helpful, especially in the Cold War, in fact. Now, um, it is a solid ally in in the region. So while I think the Americans maybe would prefer Israel to not be expanding the settlements, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't damage their strategic interests if they do. So they're sort of happy to say, oh, well, vocally, we'd prefer you don't do it, but we're going to let you do it while giving Israel the ultimate backstop because Israel, as you say, sort of is an outpost of, of, of the West. I'm going to do something cheeky and, and promote a side project of mine. I did a recent episode with David Waring um, why Britain backs Israel. Um, you can look that up, Crash Course with Michael Walker. It's getting great reviews, that particular episode, on all good apps. CNN tends to be a pretty pro-Israel outlet, but every now and again, the truth is breaking through. Nima el is the channel's chief international investigative correspondent, and she explained to Wolf Blitzer what happened when she tried to see Palestinian detainees released in Jerusalem. That was as part of the Israel-Gaza prisoner exchange. You were outside a prison in Jerusalem where Palestinian prisoners were released and reunited with their families. What did you see? Well, Wolf, we weren't allowed to see anything. Uh, Israeli authorities blocked off roads, corralled the media into one location, um, brought the Palestinians in uh, through the back door when they received them, and then only allowed family members to come in very limited single file in individual cars. And there's a reason for that. Because unlike uh, the images of celebration, where you, which you might have seen from Ramallah and the West Bank, here in East Jerusalem, Israeli authorities were better able to enforce the diktat of their far-right national security minister, who has, who has deemed the prisoners released today as terrorists. But not just that. He said any Palestinian who celebrates will themselves be charged as terrorists. I, I mean, just to break that, break, break that down a little bit, there is no grounds to call them terrorists because by Israel's own reckoning, those 39 pr prisoners were uh, 15 minors, 10 of whom were only charged, and 24 women, 23 were, sorry, were detained, not charged, and 10 of the minors were detained, not charged. It's, it complicates telling this story. So imagine your daughter has come home to you and you have to hide indoors to express your joy. Now, I think that report was really important for two reasons, right? First, it blows open the Israeli lie that the people they detain are terrorists. Right? They are often not charged, so have no idea why they are, why they are there. It is actually more like a hostage situation. Right? These are captives. These are, it, it, Israel's always trying to say, "Oh, you know, Hamas released hostages. We're releasing um, terrorist suspects." No, they're often releasing people who have no idea why they've been detained in the first place, and that have been detained for indefinite periods of time without ever knowing um, when they will be released. Um, second, the second thing. Um, that I think that report showed, is how the most normal expressions of love and family life are suppressed by Israel when it comes to the Palestinians. Now, imagine you have a daughter who's been kidnapped from you, yet when they are returned, you'll be charged as a terrorist if you publicly celebrate, right? 
That's dystopian. Not only has your kid been kidnapped, but when they're returned, if you celebrate, then suddenly you're a terrorist and you're liable to get kidnapped, right? Dystopian. Let's go back to the report. I want to show you this video, Wolf, of a, a daughter reuniting with her mother that was sent to us by the family. Take a listen. That young lady you see there, the reason, I mean, I can't, there's no reason, it's her daughter, but beyond that, uh, she had been arrested at the age of 16, uh, convicted at 17 for 10 years, accused of uh, attempted stabbing. Her family and her lawyer and Israeli and Palestinian rights groups say that this was a miscarriage of justice. Her family had taken this all the way to the Israeli Supreme Court and her mother had lost hope. So the idea that uh, Israel's far right figures are demonizing Palestinian joy in this moment is part of a bigger picture, Wolf, that we have seen play out where they're not distinguishing between Hamas and civilians, Wolf. It's really, really moving, impressive report. And as we said on a previous show, Wolf Blitzer, so the host there, used to work for the Israel lobby, APAC, the Israel lobby group APAC in, in the United States, so the most important one there. So him hosting that kind of exchange could seem significant. I mean, Ash, do you think that's significant? I think it is significant. And we've seen Wolf Blitzer in previous segments articulating his shock and even dismay at IDF commanders who are trying to argue that they're only targeting military infrastructure and that their response in the Gaza Strip has been proportionate to their military objectives. So maybe he's going on a bit of a journey. And I don't want to downplay the importance of that kind of footage. I think in particular where there has been an implicit media competition over whose suffering gets to be seen, whose suffering gets to be uh, represented, whose suffering gets to become politically meaningful between Israeli and Palestinian civilians. It's obviously really important to show that kind of footage. And also, I think, um, shine the light of truth on the Israeli narrative about who these people are um, and and show that narrative up for what it really is. But I think that this footage, it's also within a sort of script of acceptable depictions of Palestinians. It's terrorists or perfect victims. And a more, I think nuanced political understanding of what it means to live under occupation, what that does to a people and its political institutions, that's the thing that you're not allowed to do because, of course, those political institutions are just meant to be terrorists. So it doesn't shift the frame that much, but I'm also not denying its overall importance. What do you think of the fact that, you know, it, it, you get called a terrorist if you publicly celebrate the return of someone, you know, it's, it does seem dystopian sort of in the sort of quotidian control of people's lives. Not only are you detaining people, you're policing how emotional someone can be in public, right? Celebrating the return, I suppose, because if they, you know, if they saw people celebrating the return of these people, that would suddenly raise the question, well, were they really terrorists? You know, like it, it humanizes um, the the victims of their intern policies, and that's precisely what they don't want, right? So this is almost a sort of PR thing. Yes, we will we will release some people because that means that Hamas will release some of our people. Um, but we don't want this to be an opportunity for the world to sort of notice the fact that we do arbitrarily detain people's kids. You talk about the sort of dystopian pettiness of banning celebrations. This is something that Israel has a very long history of. So for years, it was against the law in Israel to make art which used the colors white, red, green, and black. Um, because of course, those are the colors of the Palestinian flag. And that's part of how the watermelon became a symbol of Palestinian resistance. Because if you couldn't use the colors 
of the flag in your work because that would be seen as pro PLO propaganda because it uses the colours of the Palestinian flag. Well, you would sort of point to this object in nature, which has the colours red, white, green and black. But that was an exceptionally petty measure. And it was in Israeli law for a very long time. Um, you know, it's even the case that Palestinians are limited in how much rainwater they can collect, because in Israel's view, uh, that's part of Israeli sovereignty. It's an Israeli natural resource. I mean, these things are hugely petty. And I think that, yes, there's a PR angle to it, but it's also part of how colonial domination works. It has to be totalizing and it has to be intrusive because the minute it's not, and the minute that people have some degree of autonomy, well, that begins to translate into political autonomy and that undermines a colonial project. And that's very well put. A good note to end the show on. Thank you as ever, Ash, for joining me tonight. Thank you so much for having me. In spite of all the technical difficulties, we struggled and we persevered. <laughs> Let's not talk about the technical difficulties. They're in the past now. Um, thank you everyone for watching this evening. Come back tomorrow for another live stream from 6pm. For now, you've been watching Navarro Media. Good night.